Greetings everyone, Jonathan Bailey here from Plagiarism Today. Usual uh, contextual information is appearing below. Um, today I want to talk about something that's a little bit difficult for uh, me. It's definitely a touchy subject and it's a very emotional one. Um, if you've been on the internet much in the past uh, day or two, you've probably seen uh, this image right here. It's a photo that was taken by, it's a photo of, I should say, uh, Lester Chambers. He is the um, lead singer of the Chamber Brothers. And here he is holding up a photo, and I, I know you couldn't read the text in that, and I'm going to read it to you in just a moment, uh, describing his, I guess you would say, uh, situation now as a 72-year-old uh, man. Uh, I'll just read the actual text from the image real fast. He says, I am the former lead singer of a 1960s band. I performed for thousands Atlanta Pop 2, Miami Pop, Newport Pop, Atlantic Pop. I did not squander my money on drugs or a fancy home. I went from 1967 to 1994 before I saw my first royalty check. The music giants I recorded with only paid me for seven of my albums. I have never seen a penny in royalties from my other ten albums I have recorded. Our hit song was licensed to over a hundred TV, 100 films, TV, and commercials without our permission. One major studio, one major TV network used our song for a national commercial, um, and my payment was $625. I am now 72, uh, trying to live on 1200 a month. Sweet Relief of Music Charity is taking donations for me. Only 1% of the artists can afford to sue. I am the 1%, I am the 99%, rather. Um... Basically, Lester Chambers was the head of the Chambers Brothers. Uh, their act, act their, the song that they're best known for is Time Has Come Today, is the song he's really best known, the, the group is best known for. Um, <clears throat> right off the bat, I have nothing but sympathy for Mr. Chambers. Uh, heart definitely goes out to him. To, to be a man of 72 and to have led such an esteemed career and to now be functionally homeless. I mean, you go into his Wikipedia, you go into more of the history, see how, just how bad the situation is for him. He was literally living in a rehearsal hall. Yoko Ono uh, helped him uh, rent a place to live. Um, obviously, it's a very difficult situation for him. That My heart goes out to him. So right then and there, nothing but sympathy and um, wishing the best for Mr. Chambers. Uh, so the question is, how did this happen? Um, what took place here? How is it he has seen so little money? And the honest answer is we don't know. Um, we don't know the contract he signed. We haven't heard the record label signed. There's really not much of it. His record, by the record label now, is Capitol Records. It was Explosive Records, bought by Capitol. And, of course, like a lot of the record labels, the merging and so forth, we, we don't know. You know, which label signed what, did what, etc. We don't know who, you know, had a hand in getting the sun deal. We can only take a few guesses, and one of the guesses we do have is that he was a black musician signing record signing record contracts in the 1960s. And you don't need to be very uh, bright on American history to know that was a very very difficult time for black musicians. Um, it didn't end very well. It was a, it was a tough time for musicians in general, though. Um, because at that point, there really was no alternative. If you wanted to make a living in the music industry, you had to sign a record contract with a major record label. There was just no two ways around it. It's not like today. Today, you've actually got options. You And uh, Trent Reznor himself actually talked about this. And Trent Reznor, of course, being very anti-record label these days. Um... But Trent Reznor actually said that if you want to become a famous musician, if you want to be that big rock star, that big country musician, that big, you know, whatever, you have to sign on with a major record label. You have to sign that big 360-degree deal. You have to take a disadvantage deal, get that support, get that investment, and that will give you at least the chance, maybe not a very good chance, but the chance to get out there and be the next Lady Gaga or whatever. Now, obviously that's not completely true. Um, Adele is actually on an independent label, which is another alternative, which is to go to a smaller independent label, get their release structure, but you won't have quite the financial uh, promotional support there. Or you can go the uh, Jonathan Colton route and other musicians that have simply uh, done it themselves. Nothing wrong with that either. Um, so basically, there are options today that were not available in the 1960s, at least not you know reasonably available in the 1960s. And 
So the record contracts today are obviously a bit different. They're also better understood today. More musicians are going into these deals knowing what they're signing because there's so much history with this. Um, but obviously seeing something like this calls into question, you know, whenever we see Kerry Sherman and so forth uh, talking about the RAAA is looking out for the artist, it, this type of thing calls that into question. And it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult pitch to make that the RAAA is supporting artists whenever you hear stories like this. But Kerry Sherman also said, and I think this was a very um, good way of putting it, the RAAA, the record labels, are fundamentally in uh, venture capitalist firms for musicians. They give musicians money, some of them take off and they make their money back in spades, some of them don't, and that money either never is made back or is made back only just so. And you know the rest, what the record labels do—they invest in artists and pray and hope that enough take off to the point they end of the day they can afford to invest in more. But the record label, obviously, through that structure, I mean, venture capitalists are not exactly well loved either, for many of the same reasons the record labels aren't particularly well loved. But the bottom line is, you know, it, it's obviously calls into question that that sales pitch of we're here for the artists. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is. More than anything, I want this to be encouragement for artists to think very long and hard about the route they want to take with their careers. If you're fine not being a big rock star and playing the sold out arenas and you're cool making thirty five to fifty thousand dollars a year off your music and not getting rich, but being able to afford food, a house, a car, that type of stuff, you know, maybe a major label isn't the best approach for you because, you know, it's just like a business. Once you sign on with that venture capitalist firm, that's, you know, it's both going to be an asset and an albatross around your neck, too. It's, it's, a, it's a give and take. It's, it's a contract. It's a deal. And it seems like Mr. Chambers certainly got the worst end of that deal. Uh, one other thing really quickly, even though this isn't entirely related, I do want to point out. I did look this up. Uh, it turns out Mr. Chambers uh, did not write the songs, including um, The Time Has Come Today. Did not actually write them, and that's important because that pretty much cuts his royalties in half, or even worse in half in many cases, um, because he's not going to get the songwriter royalties that he would be getting if he had uh, contributed to write. Apparently it was two of the other brothers that wrote the song. I, we don't know how they're doing, what royalties they were seeing or were seeing, so we, we obviously still don't know that. It, it, it still could be just as bad. Don't know, but it's an interesting point worth looking at, and I don't have the uh, facts and figures on that in front of me. Um... Long story short, this is a very tragic case. Uh, it calls into question a lot of the music industry's pitches, and it, I would really like to see the music industry do a better job of taking care of its own than what it's obviously done in the case of Lester Chambers. I think it would be better for everyone if that were the case, but we still have to remember that um, these the record labels are, as they put it, you know, venture capitalists for musicians. They're looking out for their own bottom line first, and that's what you would expect from a venture capital firm. So don't think of a record label as you know an artist charity think of it like I said as a venture capital firm for musicians an important part of the process yes less important today than it was say 50 years ago yes but still relevant definitely still something that a lot of artists won't need and seek out openly so just remember all that um, when thinking about these issues well I've already gone way over the a lot of time I wanted to talk about this today so on that note this is Jonathan Bailey Signing off.